and welcome back to Cenophiles, the internet's number one, and yeah, number one. Because still we're number one, ones. still still probably we are the ones, still probably the onlys too. Um, yeah, I mean we don't. There's no way to prove that. I can prove that we're the number one because I know we're the best. They're the twos. We're the ones. Like exactly. Um, so we're the number world number one John Cena film and TV review podcast and Twitch channel. Uh, we have talked about doing this episode for quite some time, and by that I mean in passing, uh, sporadically over the last few months. Mike is currently on um, assignment in Roku City. Uh, we had just hung out last night to watch the topics that we're going to talk about today. It feels very good to be back. Good to be podcasting again. Uh, how have you been, Henry? How has your your 2022 been? Because it's it's been a while since we've been on the air. Um, my 2022 is best described um, by one of two things that Rick Ross said on television this year. Um, one is something that would get me uh, fine from the FCC. And the other is accusations. Um, <laughs> so, nah, it was a good year. Uh, we got to go to Nashville. I got to finally experience the Nashville of Mike Andronico's affections. The, uh, yeah, somehow I've become a, uh, a Nashville expert as, as of late, uh, two, two trips in a month. Uh, I guess I'm just the, the unofficial guide, but yeah, we had a good year. We, we, we went to wrestling shows literally all over the country did some traveling uh this past monday we were both at the wwe live event at madison square garden had a great time got to watch drew Gu uh drew gulak have a 15 minute match for no good reason and it was oh no there's a good reason it was a great match <laughs> it was uh it made me very happy so it's been a fun year i can't believe we're already uh as of this recording it's new year's eve 2022 i feel like it was literally just yesterday that we were at your apartment last new year's eve watching wrestling and that's exactly what we did last night and we're going to talk about that a bit later um but yeah a big reason we're here uh not just because we miss you guys and we feel like shooting the breeze but there's new john cena content to talk about uh both in the film and the sports entertainment world and um we're not in my content we don't just mean the meme machine that is mr cena or his rapidly growing bald spot um like John Cena's hair told him you can't see me and it's true. But I was saying this. Yeah, we'll we'll get to that a bit later during the uh yeah. during when we talk about his SmackDown match, but I, I can't wait for John Cena to, to join the ranks and become one of us. Uh it's only gonna make us more powerful, is what I'll say. I love that you use the second person um plural when it's not me involved. So it's like like I'm still holding on, thank somehow. By us, I mean bald kings. Yeah. Uh, and and by the way, uh, Carrion Cross is banished for faking for appropriating uh, our identity. Um, speaking of accusations, how do you um, respond to allegations that you are ranking Dax Harwood highly on your wrestlers of the year list just because you share his follicle um, profile? Listen, I love Dax Harwood, and the fact that he's bald is only about. I'd say maybe ten, eh, there's some bias, maybe like 15% of that. It's actually the mustache that sways him for me more so than his, his beautiful bald head. Um, guy has a great mustache. See, for me, it about, was, yeah. No, I was going to say, yeah, 80% of why I love Dax is, you know, what he does in the ring and on the mic. But anytime, you know, I can really connect with a, a, a great smooth headed wrestler. Um, that's always a plus, you know, um, it's uh, it's an interesting situation going on there, and I gotta say, I just I gave him the point for that one promo about his daughter because I um, I matured in twenty twenty two. I got to um, not be entirely negative when somebody's kids get brought up. That's how I matured this year. Um, it's called growth. Did you know that John Cena got married in twenty twenty? I knew he was married. I didn't know the exact year. What happened? To, I didn't realize his second marriage already happened. Um, can you guess the age gap between he and his second wife? I'm gonna say ten years. You've got prices right positive points because you're only um, it is twelve years. Okay, I was in the right ballpark. Yeah, uh, Shay right. Sharia Taz Sharia Taz. Okay, 
Um, I am not going to get caught trying to mispronounce something I can't pronounce again, but John Cena and his Iranian wife, uh, who was born in 1989. So that makes her a Taylor Swift album, I think. Oh, she's literally my age. Yeah, no, she is a 33-year-old. They met at a restaurant. There was uh, This is a quote from John Cena. There was one woman I was looking at, and I couldn't take my eyes off of her. Um, that quote is secondhand from Keegan Michael Key, Cena's co-star from Playing in Fire. Um, so, uh, so Henry, I guess it's safe to say that as of that marriage, John Cena is no longer an independent. You know, speaking of independence, if you search that word on Peacock, you find two things. One is a roundup of all the promotions that got into bed with WWE in that whole whatever. And then a film that you probably didn't hear about. A film that I only heard about through my job uh, covering films and stuff. And I realize I should have the uh, monitor down a little bit so my Lauren Moran shirt is more visible. But, um, yeah, John Cena is technically in a film called The Independent. It It's technically a film. It came out this year on Peacock. Um, as the kids say, it is on the cock. And... Mike, if you had to describe the independent in one word, what word would you choose? Forgettable. Yeah, it's like the like I wouldn't call it a bad film, even though I think I, I we'll get to our rating later. Yeah. But it was just the most generic, forgettable political thriller. It, it was it didn't do anything egregiously bad. It's just the most generic thing I've ever seen. And it's barely a thriller, even. It's like a political... Like, my word would be, like, ranty. It's my word. Because yeah, political it, drama. Yeah, my word is ranty for it. Um, but, uh... It's a, it's a movie where John Cena plays a presidential candidate, which is funny that now he and The Rock have something else in common that they've both mm -hmm. played. Uh, and I think there were maybe four scenes with john cena in this movie if i didn't, I didn't that's a that's about right um yeah maybe that's why there wasn't right there i think there are several reasons why this movie came out uh about two months ago on november 2nd and there was really no chatter about it um despite starring you know one of the 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 most recognizable uh faces in the, in the game but um yeah, John Cena, as it turns out, is really just a background character in this film. Uh, as Henry said, plays this promising hotshot independent candidate who looks to be an alternative uh, between the Republican and Democrat options. We've seen that story before. Obviously, uh, in the real world, there are many, many parallels and references. But uh, before we get into the nitty gritty of uh, what we liked and, and what we didn't like, probably going to be a lot more on the latter Going to do my usual Wikipedia Rotten Tomatoes roundup. Not a whole lot to report on this film. Again, released on Peacock November 2nd. Has a running time of 108 minutes. Some interesting production tidbits, though. So apparently the screen the screenplay has been kicking around as far back as 2013, where Evan Parter's uh, script ended up on the blacklist, an annual survey of the most popular screenplays that had not yet been produced. And apparently got some very good feedback and responses at that time. And then production started really ramping up way later in February of 2020. Kum, uh, I don't want to mess up Wait, his name. No, but February 2020. Let's just take a note here. Um, yes, this movie was in born in the start of the panty. So, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, fun little tidbit. Uh, Kumail Nanjani was in the original cast and for some reason by the time the rest of the cast was added in september of 2021 he was gone so we could have had maybe a more fun film with kumail in there what uh, role was but do, do they know what role he was supposed to play it does not say i could I, I could think of a few but maybe as sterling's assistant and eli's partner or there are probably a few roles he could have played but anyway yeah. Uh, principal of photography actually didn't start until late 2021. So certainly, certainly a film affected by COVID, but not filmed during like the real eye of it. Um, then again, it actually, this was filming in New York City, December of last year. That was actually like peak Omicron. So maybe that explains some of the weird stuff we'll get into. 
Um, as far as the reception goes, uh, this movie is sitting at a crisp 33% on Rotten Tomatoes for the critic score, a surprising 85% in the audience score with 50 plus ratings. That shocks me because even like the sickos like us that are going to watch this for John Cena, we didn't really like this very much. So like, I don't know which that. which sickos would actually like even I would I definitely Brian Cox's sickos wouldn't like this. Like Succession Army would be turning their nose up at this completely. I, I, I wonder who's putting these user reviews in. I feel like I feel like the people making these user reviews are like mi- like working class middle-aged folks who are like oh this is an interesting political drama like people that just love a good love the west wing maybe just love a a by the numbers political drama i don't know it does have uh, a a minor west wing cameo um toby i believe um not toby um is a different character but yeah there is uh cj's love interest from the early seasons of the west wing is a has one has a one scene and he's done appearance. It felt like that guy who our main character yells at basically in a hallway politely and is never seen from again. Like yeah, and that is a scene where I was sort of Mike. I, I don't want to jump in too far. This movie is too complicated. It, it, I shouldn't be rushing it. Um, we need to start where it all begins because mm-hmm. if their time is up. <laughs> <laughs> oh man so yeah i don't i i don't think we're gonna do the usual scene by scene breakdown that we usually do because there's there's not a lot of john cena to discuss in this film but we have to talk about the beginning uh to set the scene we're watching uh john cena as nate sterling deliver one of his big presidential uh campaign speeches and he's giving his whole spiel like i said about he's kind of the alternative he's looking out for the everyday person he's gonna make the environment better he's gonna make the world a better place he doesn't have the interests of you know these big lobbyists in mind or, or whatnot um and a f- maybe f- not even five minutes into the film he quite literally says referring to you know all your typical politicians their time is up our time is now referencing his favorite wrestler, John Cena, one of his signature catchphrases. Uh, I was die. This absolutely killed me. I loved the campy self-awareness of it all. There's actually, we'll try to put it in the show notes somewhere. Or if you just go to Henry's Twitter. I just retweeted there's a clip it. Of, there's a clip of this scene and my reaction to it, which kind of says it all. Um, so right off the bat, we get John Cena as this political candidate giving this speech, literally quoting himself, quoting his wrestling character. Um, which blew my mind. And I was actually, at this point in the film, I was like, all right, I'm ready. Let's strap in. Like, this this is going to be a good time. And Magan says he got Cena's Fortnite skin over the summer. So Cena's been a busy guy. Cena's been a busy bee. And Oh, that's right. That's an important... Um, the thing yes, is... Yes, yeah. he's... he's <laughs> go on. No, no, the thing is, like, Cena was, is a busy man, but he's not busy with um, this movie. Like... The big problem here, and it's sort of, it's sort of the reason why I think it's part of the reason why we're not going to have a lot to say about it. But like, it's um, there you don't get a lot of him, and it's sort of in a very, uh, I want to say, frustrating way. But like, don't tune into this movie for that because it's yeah, and just to, and just to explain why. So, the real the protagonist of this movie is a woman named uh, Elisha Eli James, played by Jodie Turner-Smith, who I think did a pretty good job yeah. with what she was given. Yeah. She was solid. Um, and it's really about her reporting on this campaign and realizing that uh, despite his presentation as the everyman that doesn't take uh, money from you know sketchy companies, uh, it turns out that the opposite may be true, that this whole campaign may be funded by some... Uh, uh somewhat suspicious sources and maybe he's not playing uh as clean of a ball game as he's presenting so it's yeah it's really a story about an investigative reporter who's you know kind of the the underdog the outcast at her at the washington chronicle where she works her one colleague that kind of takes her under her wing nick booker played by brian cox of uh, uh succession fame the the whole movie is really them digging into this guy and finding things that you know finding some some pretty 
major revelations that will affect how he looks in the public and deciding what to do. So it's really, yeah, again, it's a it's a political drama about a reporter uncovering a candidate's dirty laundry. It's also so, about journalism. Cenas, it's also very much about like the newsroom and like the decline of the American news. Like I mean, that's just one or two scenes really, but like it's the least John Cena y a uh, John Cena movie has been to this date. Yes, Brian X, uh, sorry, Magan, Brian Cox was also an X2. We brought that up last night. Um, it, he, Brian Cox is a guy who. I don't know if anybody is below this movie. I feel like everybody is above this movie, but Brian Cox's appearance in it may be the weirdest thing to me because, like, I mean, a payday is a payday. And like when mm. all these streaming systems are trying to get all these people and these services, they need to get, they're they're doing what they can to mm -hmm. make all the content possible. But it's a movie about de detective work, but it's no Batman. It's no yeah, and, and, and I think I think all the actors involved did a good job. There wasn't anything. I think it was. I, I don't even want to say poorly written, but the the whole the whole screenplay was a cliche. It was all just these these really cheesy one-liners I, I think henry you caught me like saying the lines before they came out we were oh, watching yeah. it together last night because it was just all these ham-fisted um dialogues about the truth and you know do it doing what matters and doing what's right uh which is all well and fine but again just very uh, just a very generic script very predictable i do but you know uh, uh this is a john cena podcast and i do want to talk about the, the few moments we did get with him and what we thought of his performance. Yeah. So the starting scene, um, the thing about the starting scene is that it's less memorable for, I mean, it is incredibly memorable for his line of dialogue where he quotes his own theme song or his, just his, he quotes himself. But at the same time, it's incredibly also the first big indicator where it's like, oh, John Cena is being filmed on a green screen. And it's weird and awkward because you have these tight shots on Cena delivering this promo. It's a stump speech. I think it's like he's already declared at this point because this is the scene that it's like this is how certain movies try to be bigger than they are. It's like, oh, this is the scene from the end of the movie, but we're showing the start of it at the beginning mm -hmm. of the movie. And it's like Cena, twist. Cena doing Cena. It's like. Honestly, I think of his performance and his character sort of the same way I see of his Twitter account. Yes, a very uh, the very all American good guy, very you know, do what's right. Henry nailed it. It really is Cena just being himself. And when I say being himself, like being this the modern incarnation of Cena, just very charming, friendly. You know, after the speech, I think the next time we see him, his, his initial interview with Brian Cox's character, just talking about why he's doing this campaign. Again, just being, he's he, he's literally fresh off a workout in his t-shirt, being very personable, very charming, being like, oh, well, I'm running for president because I suck at golf. Like, you know, he's being the way I, the real John Cena would be in an interview, I feel. Oh, good. I've got a person to block. Um, is it kick or... Uh, ban. This is spam. This is fun. Uh, we're blowing up. I think that's a good sign that you know, Cenophiles is growing. If we're if we're getting uh yeah. spam bots in the chat. Yeah. Um, uh, also, I realized there was a movie I didn't remember for our list at the end. So, um, but so it's it's very much like John Cena sickos should watch this movie. Fill in the blank for after like. As we're we're basically saying like the three the three or four Cena scenes you get are very much yeah. boilerplate and by the book. What circumstance would you recommend a John Cena fan to watch this movie? Um, if you're so obsessive to the point where you host the podcast, ranking and reviewing every single movie that John Cena has ever been in and discussing it in uh intricate detail this might be the film for you i don't know if i would recommend i mean maybe i would recommend that everyone watches the opening speech because of that hilarious one-liner and i i wish the rest of the movie had that same level of like camp and self-awareness instead it's just very self-serious and generic 
I, I don't know. I wouldn't recommend it to many Cena fans. I will say, as we said, this is Cena being Cena through the end. Uh, spoiler alert. If you guys you guys have a second to, to click off, if you're somehow don't mute us, be mute us, mute us, mute us. Um, I don't really. I mean, I, I think it's OK. To, to yeah, say. yeah, yeah. So the big twist, I wouldn't even call it a twist. But as it turns out, uh, Mr. Sterling is taking some dirty money. He's in cahoots with Super Lotto and and he's being funded by the lottery and it's a very sketchy scheme. So he gets caught, you know, they catch him on this and there's a, you know, there's a big scene between the journalist and him and his campaign advisor. And even when it's revealed what he really did, he's still kind of that almost bumbling good guy scene. And he's like, oh, it was a, you know, I didn't mean anything by it. It was a victimless crime. crime. It was just a, yeah, it was just a temporary thing, and he was trying. He was desperately trying to bribe the journalist. He's like, "You guys will have exclusive access to the Oval Office. I'll give you this. I'll give you that." Uh, but even then, there was there was no like sinister turn in this movie where he became like a villain. Villain. He just was kind of a bumbling idiot who thought he could temporarily uh, swindle some lotto money to uh, get his campaign going. And it's. Um... I would also recommend Cena fans who are on an airplane that has Peacock. Like, yeah, sure. It's good for the scenes where Cena's in it. And it's even better for falling asleep because the, the plot is so generic and boring that like, even when somebody's delivering a passionate, angry tirade about the evils of politicians in America, you might still fall asleep. And that's, I think the best sort of, I think the best part of this movie was the Michael Gandolfini cameo. Yes, that's the thing. James Gandolfini's son, who I I don't know if I'd actually seen him in any movies. Just the, I just remember the trailer for um, Many Saints of Newark over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, The Sopranos 2. Yeah, it's... Um, yeah. Uh, no, The Sopranos yeah, he pl Zero. He plays the Sopranos prequel. <laughs> uh, he plays a caterer whose company ends up being an integral part of... Uh, Sterling's campaign and it really it's that's what starts the uh the investigation and getting into the, the dirt of what this man's doing but anyway all right I, I don't think we need to to say much more about this yeah, film. No, it kind of no. is what it is where do what where do we think this sits on our uh so, on our scale um I, I I'm gonna put it pretty low um I'm gonna tr I'm Same. putting up the spreadsheet um right now the lowest of the low is the reunion which I think the reunion is in retrospect, the independent makes the reunion look amazing. Yeah, I would almost, I would definitely put it at the very bottom. I, I think it's a this zero is maybe a point five. I'm going point. I don't, I think the difference is great enough where I would go point two point two five knuckles out of five. That's fine. I, th I think it deserves more than zero strictly for the their time is up. Our time is now. Yeah. So yeah that's I'm, what I'm good saying, with the a point two five. That's I'm good with a point two five. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. In retrospect, the reunion. That's, uh, I it almost give seems the reunion like we were... its flowers. I got it's a much. <laughs> right. Like I would so I would I would rewatch the reunion. I will never watch this film again. The reunion at least made me laugh and had some silly moments. Uh, oh, yeah. Wow. Magan, you're right. Um, James Gandolfini's son will be in Daredevil Born Again. It's exciting. Uh, one of the most anticipated Disney Plus shows, I would say. Um, no offense to Grogu. Good. No offense to Grogu. Yeah. Good. Um, yeah. Good year for, for Tony Soprano Jr. So uh, because, you know, some folks might be coming in for the first time or for the first time in a while. Let's uh, before we move on, let's take a look back at our let's let's look at our full rankings as it stands right now. You want to go worst to best? Yeah, let's do that. So after the reunion, which is a one a one knuckle out of five, um, mm -hmm. you get Legendary, which is a film. I always did any other day I could put Legendary in the reunion in like back or like up or down order. It's um, a very wholesome movie that nobody's going to ever have seen, starring Mr. Cena. Um, and it's other people. I believe D uh, Danny Glover is in this. Danny Glover was in that film. Yep. And that's a 1.5. Then the Flintstones and WWE Stone Age Smackdown with two knuckles. 
that was the one where uh, Fred Flintstone becomes a wrestling promoter and he meets Vince McMahon in the... Man, that's how long it's been since we've done an episode. Vince McMahon it's used been a long to be time, but great film. Vince McMahon used to be yeah. a thing. Um, the Marine One at two point five, playing with fire, mm -hmm. a decent firefighter comedy, three point five. Uh, sorry, three. Then also at three, Scooby Doo WrestleMania mystery and twelve mm -hmm. rounds. John, Mike, would you bring us home for the top half? Yeah, so rounding out the top half, we have Vacation Friends, uh, a Hulu film from last year, 3.5 out of 5. Very funny movie. It's getting a uh, sequel Ferdinand's soon. Also, yes, that's right. Can't wait. Uh, Ferdinand's animated film, uh, three, also a 3.5. Lots of fun. Uh, F9, 4 out of 5. I think more of a great film, less of a great Cena film, yeah. but nonetheless. I, I can't, we'll, we'll get to that, but can't wait to see him in Fast X. Uh, Bumble, rounding out the top. Four, Bumblebee with a four out of five. Uh, Blockers with a 4.5. Incredible film. Yeah. One of my favorite performances yet as uh, the overprotective dad, Mitchell Manns. The butt number chugger. Two, at the number, butt chugger. The butt chugger, Mitchell Manns. Uh, at number two, of course, The Suicide Squad. A 4.5 Knuckles out of five where he plays Christopher Smith slash Peacemaker. And of course, number one, no surprise, Peacemaker. The incredible hbo max series where he plays the same character uh which will be getting a season two um we better be uh that's all i'm gonna say to uh david zaslav um yeah i mean they're not gonna they don't want to annoy james gunn they have to keep peacemaker no. and suicide squad those are the safest things get in terms of like the next how long is gunn's contract is it like five years or three i mean He'll, he'll be around for a bit. It's But it's very interesting looking at this list because there's a general... There, there's sort of an upward trajectory as time goes on where his more recent films are better. And then The Independent just kind of... Yeah. Yep. He just, that, that's done, it just kind of snuck in at the very bottom. It's clearly just something they phoned in and got out of the way. And part of that, I'm not going to say entirely why I gave it such a low rate. It would have... It's incredibly cheap looking... In that it has the it has a very weird visual sense where everything looks like it's shot on a green screen, and yeah, a lot of it was probably, but like the opening scene where Cena's doing a speech to the crowd, they're trying their hardest to make it look like there are people around him, but you can tell once you get to the wide shot, um, yeah, it's not. Um, but let's fast forward to what happened after we saw the Independent when the most eager hot tag ever was like, I don't like Sami Zayn probably gave a hot tag, tried to get like, a waving his hand out hot tag like that at some point. But so yeah, to set, to, to set this all up. So after uh, last night, after Henry and I watched this film, uh, which was not good, we had something much better to watch it down with, which was John Cena's uh, first televised match. Uh, John Cena's first wrestling match of the year and his first match since SummerSlam. So uh, this is a, it was basically the most anticipated uh, I am a uh, TV sorry, match. Folks, I need to run down for just one second. Um, I'll be back. So you like, want me to keep going? Yeah, I keep going. I'll, uh, yeah, keep going. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I got this. Kill time. So <laughs> I got you. So yes. So to set this all up, um, last night, January, sorry, January, geez, uh, December 30th, SmackDown, <laughs> biggest SmackDown of the year. John Cena's big return to the ring. He hasn't wrestled in about a year and a half. And the way this all came about, obviously for those following WWE, or if you're not, the bloodline are the big thing in wrestling. They're the big villains. It's Roman Reigns' crew. Sami Zayn has managed to weasel his way in there. He's the honorary Oos. Big funny guy. He's under their wing. He's probably going to get betrayed down the line. Nonetheless, uh, they've been beefing with Kevin Owens. So they challenge Kevin Owens to a tag match. Roman Reigns, Sami Zayn versus Kevin Owens and a partner of his choosing. And what an amazing surprise because Kevin Owens decided to call up his very good friend, John Cena. And I think it was two weeks ago on SmackDown when this was revealed. And I got so excited. I was sitting in a hotel room in Philly, just losing my mind. John Cena's back. He's going to wrestle. And uh, it's going to be a great way to end the year. 
And that's what we got. Um, it was, uh, <laughs> we'll, I'll, I'll let Henry fill in some of the blanks, but um, it was a very fun match. It wasn't anything extravagant, but it was exactly what it needed to be. Hey there. So, Henry, now that you're back, so just to set this up, I gave the backstory of how the match came to ah, be. The, the um, I love wrestling 1 a.m. text. Yes, all that. And uh, so now we're here. It's SmackDown, December 30th. And um, I, I, as I was, as I just said before we got an air, I think this match was a lot of fun. It was exactly what it needed to be. Nothing extravagant. Uh, it just had all, they played the hits, gave you the feel good moments. The double five knuckle that. shuffle was really well done. And WWE did their best to make the SmackDown feel big because you start with the Bray Wyatt and Uncle Howdy turns on Bray Wyatt bit. You have Charlotte Flair's return at the nine o'clock hour. And then you have this. Um, so by the fact that, yeah, the this, this second hour was what the heck kind of talk, as Magan says. Like, uh, I don't think anybody predicted that Charlotte Flair would be the SmackDown Women's Champion going into the new year. Like, so yeah. you go into that Cena match thinking, what is going to happen now? Like, I, I, I think that's, in a way, that helped them. In a way, I almost think it hurt them because it made me have a little bit oversized expectations for a story beat from this match. The only story beat you have, though, is Sammy taking the pin and the bloodline taking a loss. This yeah, there is, was there Roman can be upset about that and it can create dramatic tension on top of the earlier that night dramatic tension of Heyman making Sammy think that there's problems about the crowd's reactions to Sammy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there as Henry said, this this was really just a send the fans home happy kind of thing. No, no major storyline implications. Obviously, there's a lot of history here because. You have KO's, you know, KO and Sami Zayn, the eternal rivals slash best friends. You have Sami in the bloodline. You have John Cena and Roman Reigns. That was Cena's last big match was uh, fighting for the Universal title last year. So there were like a lot of mini storylines. This was really just an excuse to get John Cena in the ring. Um, and he, you could tell how happy he was to be, be back, how much fun he was having. You mentioned the overeager hot tag. He was literally in this in his corner holding the tag rope. So excited, so animated, just so eager for, for KO to tag him in. And when he got in the ring, you got what you expect. You got the four moves of doom. You know, you got the, sh you got the shoulder charge. You got the, uh, you got, you got a double five knuckle shuffle, which had, had some mistimings there, but it was a very feel good moment because as uh, Michael Cole mentioned, Kevin Owens' son, major John Cena fan. So that was very sweet. You got the attitude adjustment. You got KO giving Sammy a stunner and we all went home happy. It was a heck of a time, and um, it just means that we're not really sure what. Um, let's talk about WrestleMania because, yeah, uh, Magan's right. We don't know who they're going to conceivably build up to face Charlotte. Um, you could probably bring one of. Um, I don't know. Uh, I think Rhea has a good cause for uh, getting her revenge on Charlotte. But you also don't know who Cena is going to be going for for WrestleMania now. That was something mm. I was hoping we were going to get an answer for this week. But um, no clues even. Uh, Mike, who would you, gun to your head, think Cena's 2023 dance at the Showcase of the Immortals will be against? I think it should be Austin Theory. Just because the, uh, objectively speaking... I may not be the biggest theory fan, but objectively speaking, I think he's a good superstar. I think he's a great heel. He is he is the WWE prototype. He's got uh, the US championship. He's been saying the champ yeah. is here. Like much yeah, he's he has he has a certain presence that, you know, maybe a young ruthless aggression Cena may yeah. have had back in the day. I just yeah, I think it would be obvious. I think it would be great for him. Yeah. Um and it's just a great it's a great clash of personalities. Um, yeah, yeah, Logan he'll, Paul. He, it's a great John Cena. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I saw a lot of chatter about this last night, but I think it, it might have been our friend Kate that mentioned that. I, I think it's when the legends show up for or celebrities show up for a single match. It really should be to help a full time talent. Yep. And I think yeah, I, I think Cena 
versus Theory would really go a long way towards putting Theory over. Whereas if it was Cena versus Paul, they have their match and then we don't see either of them for a bit. And it just kind of was what it was. So I think that's a Survivor a SummerSlam match, to be honest. I think there is something worth yeah. doing there with Cena and Logan Paul, but I don't think you necessarily need yeah. to do it now. Also, Cena versus Theory, the face heel divide is so good. I think it would be an. Uh, I think Logan Paul would be turning heel again, and he doesn't apparently want to be, or they're trying to not to book him heel. If and if he's going against Cena, there's no way in heck Cena is getting booed over Logan Paul. So, yeah. Also, before we, we move away from wrestling and, and yep. from last night's SmackDown, I just pulled up a really interesting uh, report over from over at uh, Sportskedia. So apparently, Cena was scheduled to work a pretty big dark match that was going to be Cena, KO, Sheamus, and Drew McIntyre against the Bloodline. Um, and for whatever reason, that didn't end up happening. What did happen off air is that the Bloodline attacked Cena. And there is a clip going around of Cena's promo uh, where he just thanked everybody. Uh, but yeah, that that's that, that would have been a really cool dark match. I wonder why that was canceled. Uh, but if you look around YouTube, you will find Cena giving a very nice promo because this was almost his first year that he didn't wrestle a single match. And right at the buzzer, he got his 2022 match in. So keeping that 20-year streak going, which is great. Yep. And um, uh, WrestlingNews.co says it's Logan Paul for Cena's match. Yeah, which hey, again, I wouldn't it's hate it. Weird. I think Logan It's weird as I did for all the reasons purely, we just said. Yeah, from a purely uh for those in the chat, I'm dropping in the video of last night. But listen, for from a pure entertainment standpoint, especially this is WrestleMania Hollywood, Cena versus Logan Paul be entertaining. Logan Paul, I am so impressed by that guy. I, yeah. Like, regardless of who he is as a person, like he got he has gotten so good at wrestling. He's makes a lot of people that have been doing this for a long time look pretty bad in my opinion. Uh, he has a knack for it. He's put on some great, his match with uh, Roman Reigns was fantastic at crown jewel. He looked great against the Miz. So it would, as far as pure entertainment goes, it would be good, but I think you could build a better story with Cena in theory. Oh no, completely. Um, I would, I, no matter which one of those happens, is that your most anticipated John Cena project of 2023? Or there are five, of course, there are five Cena projects for Wrestle for 2023. WrestleMania 2023, Coyote versus Acme, which is a Wiley Coyote project. Argyle, um, a thing with who would have thought that Henry Cavill wasn't coming back like John Cena and Henry Cavill being in a movie together and John Cena being the only one who has a strong pr confirmed future in the DC movies. That's amusing. Um, Snafu, a film with Jackie Chan and Fast 10. Uh, I think you know the answer to that. Definitely the one. Uh, listen, I'm a big fan of family, so I have a bias towards any project uh, that's really about just hanging out in a backyard and eating a meal after pulling off some sort of heist uh, in the name of your loved one. So yeah, very excited for Fast 10, um, especially now that we kind of know spoilers, but we know that Jacob Toretto is going to be a protagonist now. He had a, he had a good guy turn uh, yeah. after no, it, being it, a villain of Fast 9. There, there's enough time has passed. Like, I think people can... Yeah, I will say though, like a low-key... I'm low-key excited for Coyote versus Acme because as we've covered on the show, John Cena is great in animated projects. He is he's just he's a natural at 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 being these fun, cartoony characters. And I'm sure whatever he's doing in that film, he'll have a great time with. Honestly, the root the thing I'm really frothing for, it'll probably be a bit, but Peacemaker season two is in the works. It, you know, in some level of development. Um, and that's the thing that I can't wait for. Obviously, Peacemaker, number one on our rankings. I think it's the best acting he's ever done. And now with now with James, I'm actually also excited with, with James Gunn being in charge of the DCU now. I wonder if Peacemaker will have an even bigger role in the films beyond his own show and beyond the Suicide Squad or whatever. So, yeah. So Peacemaker Season 2, whenever that arrives, is at the top of my list. It looks as if Peacemaker season two should be filming by now. 
Uh, he was supposed to be done. He was supposed to start filming until well, after Guardians 3 was done. And that's been long in the can. So, yeah, it looks like. Um, yeah, looks like we're going to be good there. Looks like they're already on board. Um, Great. So we've got a good 2023 of um, five different Cenophiles episodes to look forward to at least. At least. Because there are also... Um, surprise eh, question marks about what Zeno will be doing otherwise. Um, I'm not going to pull them up now, but let's just say that uh, we could get that Vacation Friends sequel, which is, I believe, called Wedding Friends. Um, mm -hmm. Yep. We could get that this year. There's a whole lot of stuff to look forward to. So, guys, gals, non-binary pals, we will see you next time for Cenophiles. And thank you for bearing with us today. And we will give you the salute as Mike does. And uh, to Magen, yes, the men's rumble should get a special guest. I think John Cena in the rumble. I just think that's, I think it's the yeah. surprise nobody will expect. Um, or Batista Why because not? he was backstage last night. Batista was backstage last night. Put Batista in the rumble. Um, Let's get them both. Let, Solo, Sok Solo Sokoa could eliminate both of them. It'll be great. Solo and Cena would be a good wrestle anyways uh we will talk to you both later and um adios <laughs>